Yeah, thank you, Bernd. Um, well, this is uh, what we call is uh, agile development. Uh, com comes from, from the DevOps mindset, uh, doing something like Scrum, Kanban. We do that even on conferences around here. Yeah, so I hope the first one will not be that boring. I hope everybody is awake by now. Uh, is someone not familiar with me speaking in English? So not happy, they would like to have the talk in German. Chris, no, 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 okay. Okay, so I, I try to uh, concentrate on, on speaking loud and clearly so everybody gets the big picture. Um, yeah, the first talk, uh, it's, uh, I, it's a pattern I see at customers, I see at trainings uh, that I say it's not good that we call everything a module. And uh, this is what I'm now talking about uh, within the Puppet ecosystems. We have modules around since, well, let's say the Stone Ages, something like 0, 20, anything, they already introduced modules. So why had we had modules in the first place at all? So in the first place, we had it for having the possibility of writing code once and using it in multiple patterns. So everybody is familiar with uh, an, an patchy web server. So that you can say you can have something like mod Perl, mod PHP, mod anything else is all modularized. And within this pattern, people were writing their own puppet code, were writing, saying, install me Apache and install, depending on maybe parameters, uh, what are the difference in your platform. So people were writing modules in the first place. That was, that was quite good by the time, because we needed to learn Puppet anyway, so we started writing our own implementations and our own code on how to yeah, install MySQL, install Postgres, install an Apache, for example. Mostly this was done yeah, as an in-house department, so you had the possibility, what Modules offers you is the possibility to take the code as it is in a directory structure, give it to another colleague at another department, and it's directly working. And then people were working on, let's say, making it more in a general approach. Uh, Alessandro started that uh, back in 2007, I suppose, with uh, example 42. When you had a look on that website, it was just a Git web view, and he said, hey, here are the modules I'm doing for customers. They are super generic, no private information inside. Uh, later on, we had the module forge, and now we have something like, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight thousand modules around. You will find 40 or 50 implementations for Apache. Uh, this is something we'll cover later. First, let's go back to the, to the past that we said. We had modules, we parameterized them for having flexibility, and we were able to share the code base as long as we haven't placed any personal information like certificates and keys inside or private keys inside. As long as we didn't do this, we were able to share the code. But throughout the years, the concept evolved within Puppet. We have now the Forge, as I mentioned. We have plenty of modules around there. They are super generic, but we want to have them in a certain pattern. And then within every training I'm doing, I'm learning that there, people are totally confused when we talk about modules and modules and modules. And we say, and these are three different things you have to do. I say, why, wait, 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 it's modules. Okay, we got it, yes, there's modules. And now we have something else which we call a module, yes, and, and we have another module next to it. It's from, because the technical, per, the technical basis is always the same. So the directory structure, um, uh, the way where you place it, it's, it's similar in all approaches. But we have to differentiate now because there are different modules, they have different use cases, they have different patterns, they have different reasons for being there. The first thing is what we call now a technical component module. This is the module thing I'm talking about today because I would prefer to have these modules <coughs> named libraries. The second thing is what we call the roles and profiles pattern. Uh, by the way, I did a check on, on where does the term roles and profiles com comes from. Uh, it was uh, written by Gary Laritza and another one from Puppet back in 2011 or 12. Uh, and they stated the concept of roles and profiles. And uh, I found a website uh, who where IBM were describing the PKI infrastructure on mainframes, and they used the terms roles and profiles. That document was written back in the 80s. So it isn't a new concept at all. I don't know whether the people from Puppet were, were aware about this term from IBM. 
um, but at least they were using it, saying, okay, we want to implement upstream developed component modules within our infrastructure. We have a specific setting on our servers. It's not super generic servers, it's specific servers. And for node classification, we want to have a simple node classification. That is the reason why we do roles, the business use case. To make it visible to everybody when working with a control repository, uh, by the way, uh, who, who's working with a control repository nowadays? That's mostly everybody. That's, that's good to know. So you don't have developed your own solutions around. So not the not invented here syndrome starts dropping here. So we place them into different directories for recognizing that it's different authorship. So we have the modules directory where we place upstream developed code inside, and we have the site directory, or whichever term you prefer, just don't name it lib or spec, that's something different, a site directory where you have your two other modules, the role module and the profile module. So which upstream modules am I using? Oh, we're, well, well, we're using example 42 Apache. Uh, no, don't use example 42 Apache, it's deprecated. Use the Puppet Labs Apache module, use another Apache module, but not the one from example 42. Uh, oh, we are using Puppet Labs MySQL for configuring MySQL databases. Okay, so, but do I now add these modules directly into my control repository? That's not a nice approach because you lose connectivity to upstream because you place it in your own Git repository, but it's originating from another Git repository. I had one customer uh, who was worked saying, okay, we're following the concept of development and saying when we have a larger project, which consists of smaller Git projects, we do Git sub-modules. Who has ever worked with Git sub-modules? Who liked working with Git sub-modules? Oh, Chris, okay, we have, we, have, we have to have a discussion on that, okay. No, we don't, okay. Okay, why well, this is nice, okay. So, we always had issues with using Git sub-modules because it was not developers working on the code, it was ops people working on the code. And ops people were not that deep into Git and the understanding of Git on how to deal with sub-modules. Uh, so we had quite a couple of, uh, let's say, releases which, well, caused a stable platform. Well, a non-working dead platform is also something you can consider a stable platform, but it's not really desired by management having a that stable platform. So you place them into a Puppet file, nowadays, using R10K for deployment. Sorry? Anti-pattern, Anti okay. Chris will explain later. And, uh, and you're usually, and you, then we see people saying, okay, we just place uh, the module inside, and uh, yeah, which version are you using? Oh, latest, greatest. Always the stable release. Or even better, use the master branch anytime. That's the best thing you can do. It's heavily tested. Uh, hopefully. Have you checked the test is green? Uh, okay, tests are there, yeah, but maybe they are red. Multiple possibilities how to do it. The first one is people using it directly from GitHub and uh, even specifying the commit ID they want to use. Uh, what we do at uh, all our customers where we have Puppet file, when we are not upgrading a module or pinning a module to not a specific tag or version, but to a specific commit, in the header we write, that's the reason why we pin this module to a specific version or to a specific commit. The problem with that approach, like here with the Puppet Labs ActiveMQ, is that you now rely on, functional function on other people's systems working properly. And your, Git, you know, your Puppet Master, the heart, the core of your automation infrastructure, must call something from the outside world. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a keynote at Configuration Management Camp uh, where one was asking, uh, are you fetching code directly from upstream repository servers? So FTP, DE, Debian, org, or something like that. And more than half of the people raised their hands. And that, I, I, I forgot about the name, who was it? But he just said, oh, you're having unprotected sex with the internet. Who was it? Okay. Uh, so I like that term because uh, you don't know where is it that I'm fetching the code from because you're taking it from remote sources. So the, what we recommend to our customers is place them on your local Git server, maybe in a mirror project so you have them separate, update them regularly. Yeah, but when we update them, we first have to test them. No, 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 that's just the Git side that you update them regular. 
and within your control, within your puppet file and your control repository, you specify the tag, the branch, or the commit that you would like to use. In this case, we're saying we want to use the Augeas from camp to camp, but it's hosted on our internal Git server, and we're using the version 1.6.1. The most approaches you will find within documentation, when you don't have an own Git server, they say just fetch it from the forge. So it's the same pattern as the first line, unprotected sex with the internet, fetch it from somewhere, install it in a at least specific version, and please provide versions to your modules. Well, the libraries, which we would now to call, like to call them. The other module that you usually use is implementation. You have a super generic module that describes you on how to configure SSH. But you have a specific need for SSH. Your security department uh, provides you some default settings for SSH. It might forbid you some encryption algorithm because they're saying there, this is unsecure. Please, please get, make them, remove them from the SSH daemon configuration file. So you want to implement a specific configuration based on a generic module. This is what we call the implementation profile nowadays. This is the code that you write. What we usually prefer is making the profiles parameterize and using HIRA and automatic data binding for fetching differences within your implementations. So for example, being with SSH, you have different SSH allow group settings on your servers. So not everybody may, is allowed to log in everywhere. Developers may log into developers' uh, systems. Uh, ops people, when they are there, they log into operating systems, production systems, for example. And this change is described as a parameter in HIRA. The benefit is that when you have a profile and you have parameters within the profile, you directly see in the HIRA data which implementation is using this data at all. When you just say it's SSH colon colon SSH allow groups, then you don't know where is this used by now. So we place it always in the profile, and everything else that we want to have static inside is something we also place static into the profile. So that's the implementation module, the second module. Last but least, we have the third module. So, uh, any, who is not familiar with the concept of roles and profiles, by the way? Nobody. Okay, what I'm explaining here. Ah, okay. Uh, so, within the role module, you specify what is the reason that this system exists. So, it's no longer the, what is it, PHP my admin. Uh, no, it's not the PHP my admin. Yes, it is a PHP my admin installation. It's available from the internet for everybody. I don't know why they do it that way. Maybe you can shut the system down. No, it belongs to sales. Okay, we're heading over to sales, asking the salespeople, what is this server over there? Of course, sales will tell us, ah, wait, 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 we're sales, we're earning money. Servers is run by IT, they're spending money. Ah, no, no, it's this web browser tab you have open there. Oh, that's super cool, and now I stop understanding anything. This is for our field sales engineers, the customer relationship management system. Whatever they mean to it, uh, but I just have given a name that I can use as a role, because that's the business use case that this specific system exists around. And this is what we use for node classification. What we usually say within a node classification role, inside a role module, you specify the role, and you sp within this role you specify profiles, you declare profiles, and afterwards we bring profiles in order, because we always want to have the same ordering on profiles. So now think about the days back when you started using Puppet, and you had the problem of understanding roles and profiles. So you had modules, modules, and modules. And every module was somehow yet different. It, you dealt with it in a different way, um, and it was difficult to understand why do we have three different types of modules. Let's first go to the what we call upstream modules, what I would like to call libraries from now on. So first of all, who's doing spec testing, unit and acceptance testing on modules? Okay, seems we have some module developer around here. Who's doing that on roles and profiles? Ah, everybody should raise his hands, but I only see a couple of the module developers doing that. Okay, so upstream developed modules are super generic, which means they must cover a lot of different implementations, so they must have huge set of unit tests. 
um, it, it's not quite uncommon to say uh, we're waiting up to 10 to 15 minutes for the unit's tests to be available for us, the result to be available for us, because we're testing different operating systems or the parameters that we allow for other people to make use of the module. Usually you have a larger community, not only one or two people, because one or two people, one may be sick like this morning, and uh, what will happen with PRs, they lie around and nobody takes care about them. Uh, people are switching their job. People are switching their job, moving from IT to healthcare, whatever they do, so they have no longer time or need for writing puppet modules upstream development. So look for modules that have an active community. Um, for example, the Vox Pupuli, Camp to Camp does a good work on that, uh, so that they, that they offer you a set of tested code base with a larger set of people behind that share their experience. What module developers also try to do is adopting modern best practices. Sometimes, sometimes you can't do that directly. Uh, why, why shouldn't you adopt to modern best practices directly? Why should you not do that? Who's running Puppet 6? Just two. Who's running Puppet 5? The majority. Who's still on Puppet 4? And even Elder? Wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Chris is running all versions of Puppet, I know, I know for sure. Do you still have a zero dot anything installation around? Not in production, okay, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. So as you see, Puppet has developed over the time and brought out new releases, and sometimes new best practices require some functionality that is only available in a newer version of Puppet. Well, which versions are we expect to support from an upstream developed module? Well, the least set of Puppet versions is the same set of Puppet versions that Puppet offers their enterprise customers, which is, I suppose, the latest version must be 4.10, I suppose, on a long-term support release. So people must take care, upstream developer must take care that they provide you a set of Puppet mo uh, module that deals with all possible supported Puppet versions. Sometimes a newer Puppet version brings a new feature. Think about Puppet 4.9, introducing data and modules. Think about Puppet, uh, I don't know when the sensitive data type showed up. I suppose it was Puppet 5 in this place. Uh, so things are changing, but sometimes you cannot directly jump onto the, well, uh, follow, follow the hipster path immediately and go for the newest modern thing. Sometimes you have to wait a little bit. Or at least what you can expect from upstream module developers is that they will tell you, we will have a new major version. This is also something you see on upstream developed modules that they do at versioning, and they do it in a semantic versioning way. Who feels familiar with semantic versioning? Not really everybody. Okay, so semantic versioning, I had it on the, on the, on the past slide. Where we go? Here. Semantic versioning, a three-digit versioning. Meaning the last digit on the right hand side is a patch level, so it just fixes something. The minor version might prepare for something that will change in the future or add new functionality without breaking existing installations. The major version is something that people do when they say we have changed the um, the, the way how you use the module. We have s switched to different parameter names. We are no longer supporting an older Puppet version. So take care on the versions. Uh, which version is it that supports your specific Puppet installation? So moving forward again. What else is it that you do? Well, when we talk about libraries and software development, software developers may not just download any kind of library they find in the internet, some Chinese servers, a uh, nice thing, binary compiled, uh, good, good readme next to it, and then you're wondering all your systems are under high GPU load. Oh, what's happening there? Yeah, yeah you have some Bitcoin miner, uh, be happy around, and uh, yeah. You're, yeah, so, so check for the, li for example, another thing, check for the license. There is some weird license out in the ecosystem. Um, the weirdest one I've ever seen was Aferro GPL. It's nothing to do with GNU public license, it just shares the name. Uh, it means everything is owned by the author, whoever contributes, everything is owned by the author, and the author may ever decide what kind of license fee he would like to place on you on, based on his personal assumptions. Check for the license that you are free to use it. Uh, Puppet decided to move from GPL to Apache 2 a couple of years ago. Well, well quite some time ago. I'm a dinosaur in the Puppet world, yeah. 
read the documentation carefully. And when you've read the documentation and you've understood how to use it, check whether that specific module fits your needs. Maybe there's another module that fits better to your needs. And afterwards, you first do a code review. That means you must have experience with Puppet code because the super generic Puppet code might also become quite complex to read and understand. But at least review it because you get an understanding how module development is working, what is it that you have to take care about. Maybe you learn about modern, new modern best practices by that way too. So that's the reason why I recommend to always read the, to review the code. So when we look now at the Forge, 5,800 and anything modules, 40 deal with Apache, 30 are for MySQL, uh, 20 different SSH implementations, and when you look more carefully, you will see that three of them is just a fork and a fresh upload without any changes, and uh, that was done four years ago and no further updates to it. Puppet introduced to reduce this set of, well, uh, weird things you find around. They have introduced different patterns. The first one is that you see when was the last uh, update on the module, how many people have downloaded it. Yeah, but if you will find modules would have plenty of downloads. When you look inside, I say, no, I don't want to like that module. I don't want to use it, but I already downloaded it, so it counted as a download. They have introduced the feedback, so please provide feedback to upstream libraries puppet libraries, so that tell the people you're happy with them, whether you're happy or not happy with the module, did it work, was the documentation okay, uh, and uh, yeah, and then you have these three flags within these libraries. The first one, of course, is the supported one. The supported library means that when you are running Puppet Enterprise installations, you even have support for that specific module, so not only for the base installation, but also for a module. It's covered by the PE license, but it's also easy to use on Puppet uh, open source because it, makes, it doesn't rely on having a Puppet Enterprise and it checks for license or something like that. It just means you have support when you are running Puppet Enterprise. Well, when Puppet offering support for the enterprise customer, this module, this library, is definitely good enough to also use it in an open source environment. Full stop. So you don't have to ask for anything. The next thing are approved modules. So approved module is something where you say, I'm, I'm happy with my module, I did around here, it has a huge set of spec testing, it has a great documentation, it's following the Puppet Strings guide for how to write documentation for modules, for libraries and modules and modules. Um, mostly they say it's tested on all Puppet Enterprise supported versions for Puppet and maybe even a couple more. Um, it says uh, it must have active maintainership and active developer. So that means uh, that you react when you get a pull request or a question somewhere that the, people that, you get the, uh, that the maintainers are expected to take care on the pull request, take care on the issue, update the documentation. Support by then is done by the community. So go to Slack or IRC and, and ask, for example, Vox Populi people, uh, I have a problem with that specific module, how do I use it? Please read the documentation. Yeah, it's already there. Yeah, but everybody knows reading the documentation. And now there came up a third one, which is a partner module. So this is something where an, an application vendor has, has some code base, he would like to have it automatically configured with Puppet. Uh, for example, Sensu, a comparison to Isinga. I know NetWays is also doing the Isinga module. When will you get the partner status? Ah, you have to pay for it. At least the approved status, that would be nice. But this is something you have to ask the people for. So, for example, the Sensu people, they said, uh, we take money and we provide it to the to community members uh, and uh, we want that our module to be available as a partner approved module. So one hand is companies have the knowledge in-house and they do everything by themselves or they pay someone for doing the stuff. Sometimes they even pay Puppet directly for making their module a partner-approved module. Same thing, it has, must have active development and maintainers. Uh, Puppet even looks a little bit more tightly. The approved thing is something I have the feeling you get once and afterwards nobody ever asks whether this is still an approved module. Uh, so you, you don't have to refresh this thing. Uh, support is not done by Puppet directly, but go for the, well, for the vendor of the application uh, who has the partner status within Puppet. Yeah, working with library modules. Now, okay, now we have the Puppet file. Yeah, that's great. 
We have everything inside. We mentioned the SSH module, the Postgres module, a Deer tree module, stdlib, xlib maybe. So plenty of things we have in the Puppet file. So who's, regular, who's updating its modules, libraries, versions on a regular basis? I have expected that. Sorry? Never is also a kind of a? When regular. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, when you compare it to uh, uh, that, that being a stable state, yes, then never is also something regular, yeah. Uh, no, please check it, at least on an irregular basis. So at some customers, we do it once every three or four or five months. Definitely we do it prior, we do a Puppet version upgrade because we have to check all the modules. Is the new Puppet version compatible with a set of modules that we have around? Uh, and please, it's open source. Contribute. Who's working in a governmental side of IT? Just almost nobody, everybody, private health companies around here, okay. What I, uh, we, ha we have some governmental organizations which we support on Puppet, and with one of the organizations we had a discussion lately uh, by saying, okay, yes, you need a fix for that upstream module, uh, so it's working in your environment, you need an additional parameter, and we now have two different ways how we can do it. The first one is we fix it just locally, and welcome to your fork, and you maintain it afterwards or we provide the fix upstream, we implement it locally in a feature fix branch, so we don't lose connectivity to upstream, and we provide the fix to upstream. And uh, that was quite nice because the, uh, there was the IT person and the department, head of department were both at the table, and the IT person looked at his boss and saying, um, well, you see, we are a public funded organization, so we are paid from taxes, and open source is given to us from other people. So when we use other people's money doing something, we have to make it public again. <coughs> and his head just said, yes, that's the right approach. And luckily, that's not all governmental organizations seeing it that's that way. At least in Brandenburg, they do it. Um, what the least thing you can do is write a bug report, even when the documentation might be wrong. Write a bug report that people are aware that there is something for people to fix. If you're more familiar with Puppet and you have more confidence, provide a fix. Oh, well, I'm not really good at... Provide a fix, please. The community people will guide you and tell you whether things are wrong or not, whether that's okay what you've done there. And what we usually see Tim might tell a story about that, is that people provide a PR for, ah, I am, there is a new parameter for this application, and, and here's the PR that sets the parameter, and then Tim usually is asking, can you write a spec test? Wow. We, I've only seen a couple of hands when I was asking who was doing testing, so I expect not many people to be familiar with our spec puppet and the other tools around. And usually the people say, oh, I've never done that before. Uh, have a look at that code base, have a look at that specific file, see in line number, there you already see an example that we test a parameter, just adopt that to your new parameter. We will guide you through that. If you have more difficulties, please join an IRC or in Slack channel so we can give you more real-time information on the thing. When you see something like the documentation is wrong, please do a PR to update the documentation. So they're saying there's a new parameter is not documented. Uh, yeah, please provide just a fix for the documentation. This is what we kindly ask everybody for when you're using open source upstream developed modules and you find an issue, please give back that information to the community. So what else is it that we have in libraries now? Usually you will something see like custom things. Uh, who, who knows custom facts, custom functions, custom types, custom providers? Everybody, so I don't have to explain it. So custom just means welcome to the Ruby world. Uh, you're no longer within uh, something different. It's not the DSL, it's not Python, it's not Shell, it's just uh, Ruby on this case. You have custom facts, custom function. You need some information for the module to be properly working. You need to identify is there already something installed or not. So just provide a fact that the node can deliver that information to the compiler. Maybe you need specific methods, 
So you said this is a set of data, and uh, but the but the application itself needs this data structured in another way, and maybe there is no function yet available. So please provide it in the module. Well, most people don't write modules. Yes, okay. Well, upstream people must do it. Uh, who's using XX? Nobody dares to raise their hand. Okay, I know, I know. I know, I'm, I'm very fam uh, quite well known for a couple of years ago, uh, I did a talk at uh, PuppetConf moving from XX to types and providers, and uh, I was even asking Luke, well, he was still doing the business at Puppet, when will they deprecate the XX resource type? He looked like me like uh, I'm being nuts. Yes, maybe he's true. Um, but I made that, he made that in some assumptions, which led me to, the, to this talk afterwards. Uh, so you have types and providers also in upstream developed modules, libraries, like the MySQL database, for example. So the types and providers are also something you will find not in your own code, only in upstream developed modules. So now it comes to module development, library development. And there are two different ways to go. The first one is when you have a larger set of libraries to maintain. You have a larger set of libraries on the Forge, on GitHub, and you want to synchronize. For example, we want to have an update on all of our 24 modules, libraries. How do we do it? Well, do the patch on all of the 24 Git repositories. Uh, ever heard of something like automation? So not doing something manually. This is something definitely done manually. So Puppet was doing the module sync tooling that helps you to like, maintain a larger set of libraries. What is that you are usually doing? Writing? Your, the code that you write your own? It's roles and profiles? So Puppet has developed PDK, the Puppet Developer Kit. You can use that on single modules, libraries, for sure, and I ask you, please, the code that you yourself write, your roles and profiles, generate the whole stuff with PDK or even convert it to being PDK compatible, and then add the tests afterwards for existing roles and profiles, anything new that you add, you just use the PDK new class uh, command and uh, then you have the basic spec test automatically added. So PDK is also possible also for roles and profiles. And from my perspective, I say it's not only possible, I would say it's recommended that you do it that way. Modern module development also recognizes you like making use of new functionality like the new Puppet 4 API. Who, a function API. Who is aware that you can namespace your functions within the Puppet 4 API? Wow. So what is it that you had in the past in the past, you had a function called reduce. Great. Where does this function come from? Puppet core? stdlib? Some other module? Library? I added via Puppet file? I have no idea. I can't say for sure. So that's the reason why people now start moving to the Puppet 4 function API that we know it's, see something, it's stdlib reduce or it's xlib reduce, so we can more explicitly say which reduce function is it that we want to use. In the past, they were just flat namespaces. And don't forget the new resource type API, uh, which uh, is done mostly by, by David Schmidt in, in Belfast. Um, this will provide you, and well, Puppet, Puppet supposes that this is an easier way for people to write types and providers. Uh, like Luke mentioned it a couple of years ago, we need exec because we did types and providers. Uh, too hard to understand. Uh, I, can't, I don't believe that because when you've seen the booklet, types and providers, it's a 40, 50 page booklet and describes everything on types and providers. So when you can describe something complex on 40 or 50 pages, then either it's not complex or it's incomplete. Um, I found it not really complex. So for the future, just keep in mind, don't write modules. Name them libraries, and the stuff that you are doing on your code, your infrastructure, this is what is roles and profiles, and you're only writing roles and profiles. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions? Are there any questions? Chris. So, you mentioned that you mentioned the, the quality of modules and you gave us an example like um, 
a module from Puppet Labs, which is approved and all the things, being good quality. How have you seen the evolution happening there? I'm, I'm pointing out to the example I experienced somewhere in, in August, where if you looked at the cube module, which was actually a profile, yeah. because it was managing things like XTD and things such thing within the module, which we clearly, as a community, defined as a huge anti-pattern. And when you started proposing patches to fix that, they actually refused those patches on the argument that it was a supported module and that their customers were paying for that. Yeah, and then they used a free version of Slack, so I don't have that in history anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, but that was the argument why they wouldn't accept patches. Eventually, they got accepted to remove support for etcd or even make it unmanaged. So you could move it, manage it I, from... I suppose, I suppose Tim has something to tell on that. So personally, I must say, uh, when there is an approved module and uh, you're providing patches to an approved module, the author should, well, of course, take, take careful, re carefully review them, whether they are okay. But when there is a larger set of people saying, no, this is okay, this was done, wrong, done wrong in the first place, then these patches should also from Puppet usually be accepted. So, but sometimes Puppet deals different with their own set of modules compared to... Uh, other people's libraries. Hello. Tim, something to add from your side? Okay, um, I have one thing to add. 99% um, of the Puppet Labs modules are managed by the modules team and they have a set of guidelines for modules and they probably would not have released this kind of module as you mentioned, but a few of the modules um, are managed by a different internal team uh, which is not documented anywhere, but they have completely different guidelines, and that leads to something like this. Um, one of the modules is um, Kubernetes and um, Docker, and a third one that's managed by the cloud team. What is also a pity on the Puppet Labs modules is that they don't keep the tickets on GitHub, but have them in their internal Jira system. Yeah. Where you don't find anything in that Jira. So, uh, a question from my side, how do you connect spec testing of roles and profiles versus a Puppet environment? Because that's, do you just check out the Puppet environment? Or? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so, what we usually do, so the control repository is a, a branch-based control repository, so a Git repository, so usually we, we prefer to just have the production branch, full stop. <coughs> Everything else is done in a feature branch because that makes the merging process far more easy. Otherwise, you need more Git knowledge. Um, and usually at companies where I come in, uh, the first thing is people is asking me, what is this GTI? Uh, we've never, uh, it's GIT, okay, yeah, GTI is something they have in a car here on. Uh, the uh, car by Volkswagen, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you have to first explain them the concepts of a version control system because they've never dealt with it. So we make it the easy pattern just having the production branch and just doing feature branches. The CI system, Always, always fetches the feature branch, uh, and uh, then it uses locally the R10K puppet file install command to install the modules, which are well mentioned in the puppet file in that specific branch. And then we spin up the well standard unit tests. But we 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 also do this on a on a role profile level, uh, basically only for lint testing and for minimal unit testing. So whether everything is 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 the puppet compiler able to compile a catalog at all. The bigger testing, the acceptance testing, is what we do directly in the control repository. And I haven't found a way of doing that with PDK in a simple way. It's just mostly done manually, adding all the required files. Okay. Chris is not happy with one branch only. <laughs> one branch only is the only way to do it. Okay. The branch is already anti okay, good. Uh, and the next question, uh, hire an inside control level or outside? Depends on access level. Uh, when the people that do write the roles and profiles also provide the data, then why have a second one? Mm -hmm. Just keep it in, in the control repository so your high rate data are directly connected to your puppet environment. Uh, the other way we have it at customers where other people provide information and they must be able to add them to the high rate data. Then in this case, we do high rate data as a module. So we name it 
as a library, as you can say, but it's a data library in this case. So we just mentioned in the Puppet file that we have a mod with the name Hira Data, and it's a Git repository, and we can have different access rights on this repository. So we have more people providing us information about their applications, about their, their own way, how they manage their systems, because sometimes we are at customers where they say, we are strictly DevOps silos, uh, one next to each other, and now you have some cross-functional guild tribe whatsoever. And uh, then they say, okay, this is the basis, and you can modify the basis and adopt it to your needs by just uh, injecting data into it. And this is the place where we say, no, make the Hira data separate from the control repository. So, thank you very much, Martin. You're welcome. A small gift? A small gift, a single book. No, no, <laughs> no, no, it's too light, it's too light. It, it, it sounds differently, shake it. Shake it. Now it's broken, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's have a short coffee break and after the break we should have a talk about Puppet Server. Thank you. You mentioned the, the quality of modules and you gave us an example like um, a module from Puppet Labs which is approved and all the things being good quality. How have you seen the evolution happening there? I'm, I'm pointing out to the example I experienced somewhere in, in August where if you looked at the cube module which was actually a profile yeah. because it was managing things like XTD and things like thing within the module which we clearly as a community define as a huge anti-pattern and when you started proposing patches to fix that they actually refused those patches on the argument that it was a supported module and that their customers were paying for that. Yeah, and then they used a free version of Slack, so I don't have that in history anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, but that was the argument why they wouldn't accept patches. Eventually, they got accepted to remove support for etcd or even make it unmanaged. So you could move it, manage it I, from... I suppose, I suppose Tim has something to tell on that. So personally, I must say, uh, when there is an approved module and uh, you're providing patches to an approved module, the author should, well, of course, take, take careful, re carefully review them, whether they are okay. But when there is a larger set of people saying, no, this is okay, this is what's done, wrong, done wrong in the first place, then these patches should also from Puppet usually be accepted. So, but sometimes Puppet deals different with their own set of modules compared to... Uh, other people's libraries. Hello. Tim, something to add from your side. Okay, um, I have one thing to add. 99% um, of the Puppet Labs modules are managed by the modules team and they have a set of guidelines for modules and they probably would not have released this kind of module as you mentioned, but a few of the modules um, are managed by a different internal team uh, which is not documented anywhere, but they have completely different guidelines and that leads to something like this. Um, one of the modules is um, Kubernetes and um, Docker and a third one that's managed by the cloud team. What is also a pity on the Puppet Labs modules is that they don't keep the tickets on GitHub, but have them in their internal Jira system. Yeah. Where you don't find anything in that Jira. So, uh, a question from my side, how do you connect spec testing of roles and profiles versus a Puppet environment? Because that's, do you just check out the Puppet environment? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, so, what we usually do, so the control repository is a, a branch-based control repository, so a Git repository, so usually we, we prefer to just have the production branch, full stop. <coughs> Everything else is done in a feature branch because that makes the merging process far more easy. Otherwise, you need more Git knowledge. Um, and usually at companies where I come in, uh, the first thing is people is asking me, what is this GTI? Uh, we've never, ah, it's GIT, okay, yeah, GTI is something they have in a car here on. The, the uh, car by Volkswagen, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you have to first explain them the concepts of a version control system because they've never dealt with it. So we make it the easy pattern, just having the production branch and just doing feature branches. The CI system, Always, always fetches the feature branch, uh, and uh, then it uses locally the R10K puppet file install command to install the modules, which are well mentioned in the puppet file in that specific branch. And then we spin up the well standard unit tests. But we 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 also do this on a on a role profile 
level, uh, basically only for lint testing and for minimal unit testing. So whether everything is, is, is the Puppet compiler able to compile a catalog at all. The bigger testing, the acceptance testing, is what we do directly in the control repository. And I haven't found a way of doing that with PDK in a simple way. It's, it's mostly done manually, adding all the required files. Chris is not happy with one branch only. One branch only is the only way to do it. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, and the next question, uh, hire an inside control level or outside? Depends on access level. Uh, when the people that do write the roles and profiles also provide the data, then why have a second one? Mm -hmm. Just keep it in, in the control repository so your higher data are directly connected to your Puppet environment. Uh, the other way we have it at customers where other people provide information and they must be able to add them to the higher data. Then in this case, we do higher data as a module. Mm -hmm. So we name it as a library, as you can say, but it's a data library in this case. So we just mentioned in the Puppet file that we have a mod with the name Hira Data, and it's a Git repository, and we can have different access rights on this repository. So we have more people providing us information about their applications, about their, their own way, how they manage their systems, because sometimes we are at customers where they say, we are strictly DevOps silos, uh, one next to each other, and now you have some cross-functional guild tribe whatsoever and uh, then they say okay this is the basis and you can modify the basis and adopt it to your needs by just uh, injecting data into it and uh, this is the place where we say no make the hybrid data separate from the control repository so thank you very much Martin you're welcome a small gift a small gift a single book no no <laughs> no no it's too light it's too light it, it, it sounds differently shake it shake it now it's broken, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.